we have just seen how you're going to take those the zero uh, order rate law, first order rate law, and second order rate law, and integrate them to turn them into a new equation. Well, if we took each of those equations and rearranged those three in order to get the concentration of our reactants at some time t by itself, you could see that that zero order reaction would turn into negative kt plus ro. Uh, the first order reaction would turn into the natural log of RT being equal to the negative KT plus the natural log of the original concentration of R. And then that second order is where we have that inverse of RT. Well, if we could then graph each of these equations, so on our y-axis, if we look at our y-axis on these graphs that are going to be coming up on the next few slides, the y the y-axis on that zero order slide is going to be just concentration. The y-axis for a first order reaction is going to be the natural log of our concentration. And in our second order reaction, it, the y-axis will be labeled as inverse of our concentration at some time t. As far as the slope of our equations go, um, the mx plus b so the slope in a zero order graph is going to be negative of the k value. Also, same thing, slope of a first order reaction will be the negative of the k value, and slope of our second order reaction will be positive k value. On the x-axis is going to be our time. You can see how x correlates to time in all three cases. And then our y-intercept, where it crosses that line there, um, will be either our original concentration, the natural log of that original concentration, or the inverse of the original concentration. So let's look at each of those situations a little more closely. So if we had a zero-order reaction, you're going to end up getting that straight line plot when you do concentration versus time. So here you can see how the concentration of R, our reactants, is going to naturally decrease over time, right? As time progresses, our reactants concentration decreases because it's turning into products instead. And you could see that correlation here that if we did the slope of this line, that correlates to the negative of our rate law constant. This is a lot easier to be able to solve for k than it was when we were doing our kinetics lab where we had to do all those different trials, um, finding orders and such, to, and then calculate our k's where all we have to do is really just graph it. If you got a straight line when you do a zero, if you got a straight line when you plot concentration versus time, that's how you know it's zero order. You wouldn't have to do a whole bunch of trials, get consistent timing, nothing like that. Just plot your information, and then if you got straight line for concentration versus time, you would know that it's a zero order reaction. If you have a first order reaction, if you tried to plot concentration versus time, you would not get a straight line. You'd get this curve. So because you don't get a straight line for concentration versus time, that's how you know that the particular reaction you're looking at is not zero order. It must be first order because when we do the natural log of our concentration versus time, we get this straight line. So once again, what that means for us is that, like in your kinetics lab, you wouldn't have to do a zillion different trials, get consistent timing, all that kind of stuff. All you would need to do is plot the natural log of the concentration versus time. If you got a straight line when you did that, that's how you know that it's first order with respect to that particular chemical. And once again, the slope is going to be the negative of the rate law constant. So let's just say that the slope was negative three. That means that our, uh, our k value would be three. For second order reaction, you're always gonna get a straight line plot when you, uh, when you plot the inverse of the concentration versus time. So you could see here on our y-axis, there's our one over r. 
as time progresses, now our slope's going up the opposite direction because as our reactants turn into products, our reactant concentration would go down, our product concentration would go up. But because we're plotting the inverse of concentration over time, that's going to flip our, our sign there. And now on this equation, our slope is a positive k. So what this means is that the graphs are going to tell you the order. Whichever one gives you the straight line will tell you the order of the reaction. So concentration versus time, if you see that straight line then, it's a zero order. If you see a straight line for natural log of concentration versus time, you know it's first order. And then if you get a straight line for the inverse of concentration versus time, it's second order. And like I said before, uh, the College Board does not expect you to be able to look at a graph and know if it's a zero, first, second order. Those are the only ones they want you to know. They would not expect you to look at a graph of like a third order reaction, a fourth order reaction, and know that it was third order or fourth order based on the graph alone. They do expect you to know this correlation here. The last piece that you're going to need to know is the idea of half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for the concentration of one of the reactants to reach half its original value. So let's say that the uh, molarity of your original chemical is 12 molar. Half-life is how much time it takes for only 6 molar of your stuff to still remain. Uh, it's a convenient way to describe the rate at which the reactant is being consumed because if the half-life is really long, that must mean that you have a slow reaction, that it's taking a really long time for that 12 molar to turn into a 6 molar. Uh, if your half-life is a short amount of time, the reaction must be progressing pretty quickly. So half-life for zero-order reactions. So if we're talking half-life, half the concentration, what we're going to plug in is our concentration at some time t would be half the original concentration. So what I'm going to do is substitute in half RO in for our RT. If I do that, and we simplify a little bit when we do the original concentration of R minus half the original concentration of R, we'd only have half the original concentration left. So if we wanted to get the half-life, how long it takes for that zero-order reaction for the concentration to be cut in half, if I just uh, divide by that k to get the half-life by itself, put the k on the bottom there, this one half simplifies, we put a 2 on the bottom. So if we took our original concentration, divided it by 2 times our rate law constant k, that will give us the amount of time it takes for uh, our concentration to be cut in half. Half-life is dependent upon the concentration of R for zero-order reactions, right? So if you have a, a very concentrated thing here, if this number is really big, then this number proportionally is going to be really big. It'll take a long time. If, you, if this number is relatively small, then proportionally the half-life is going to be small as well. So half-life is dependent upon that concentration of R for zero-order reactions. What about first-order reactions? So here is our first-order reaction equation. And once again, if we're talking half-life, we're saying how much time does it take for half of our original stuff to turn into new stuff? So our final leftovers of RT would be half the original. So we're going to substitute in half of the original for that RT. So when we do that, our original concentrations, R sub O there, that's going to uh, cancel out. So what we have left is the natural log of a half equals negative K times our half-life. To get the half-life by itself, we'd have to divide by negative K. 
our negatives would cancel out. So if we have that, we do 0.693 divided by k would give us our half-life. This one is the one you're going to see the most. This is the one that if you are looking at the equation sheet that the College Board gives you during your AP exam, this is the only half-life equation on there. So they give you the integrated rate law equations. They'll give you like this top line, for example. They don't tell you that that's the first order integrated rate law, but they will provide you with this equation and they will provide you with this equation. Um, the zero order half-life and the second order half-life, they don't provide you with that equation on your equation sheet. But honestly, I've never seen them ask for anything but a first order half-life. Um, it doesn't mean that it, they might not ask it in the future, but I haven't ever seen anything talking about half-life that's not first order. And then for second order, one more time, let's substitute in half the original concentration is what's left. So we plug that into our integrated rate law for a second order equation. Do a little bit of simplifying. And then get that half-life by itself. We would divide by k. And there's our half-life equation for a second order reaction. The zero order and the second order reactions were both dependent upon the concentration of R. So again, depending on if this value is large or small, it will determine if your half-life is large or small. For that first order equation, there was no concentration of R. If I go back for just a second and we look at that first order one, right? There's no R in this equation. So for first orders, it doesn't matter what your original concentrations were. Um, it's really just dependent upon your rate law constant, and that's it for those first order. For zero and for second order, that concentration, the original concentration, comes into play. So let's see this half-life example with some actual numbers. You can have the uh, disaccharide sucrose decompose into the monosaccharides glucose, and fructose according to this equation here. So our rate law, we could measure the disappearance of sucrose and um, from the bit numbers here, they tell us that K is 0.216 inverse hours. We would know that this is a first order equation based on the units for K. When you have a first order equation, the units for k are always inverse time. So based on that value of k, that tells us that we get to use this as our equation for, uh, to determine that half-life. And then we could plug in that value for k and solve for the amount of time it takes. Once we know that, we could also see how long it would take for a certain amount of it to decompose. So let's see this in action. So once again, you can tell that from the rate law that this is a first order reaction because of the units of K and because the rate law had the sucrose uh, with an exponent of an imaginary one, it's first order. So we know our equation and then we know the value of K so we could substitute that in to find the half-life. We plug in our K into the bottom of that equation and it takes 3.21 hours for half of the sucrose to turn into glucose and fructose instead. What about part B? It asked how long it would take uh, for 87.5% of that sample of sucrose to decompose. So if 87.5% has decomposed, that means 12.5% remains. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for that concentration to be cut in half. And we just determined a second ago that our half-life time was 3.21 hours. So it takes 3.21 hours to go from 100 to 50%. Then it would take an additional 3.21 hours to go from 50 to 25% left over. And then to go from 25% down to that 12.5% remaining, an additional 3.21 hours. So to go from 100% sample to 12.5% remaining, it would take 9.63 hours total.